In the past two lectures, I have discussed the science of climate change and how the scientific consensus on climate change was achieved. In this lecture, we will look at how the scientific community was sidelined by governments and fossil fuel companies and how and why the public began to doubt the scientific consensus. Much of this lecture is based on the research by Naomi Oreskes and Eric Conway, the authors of the book Merchants of Doubt. In the last lecture, we noted the affirmation of the scientific consensus on human-induced climate change by President Lyndon Johnson in his special message to the US Congress in 1965. This affirmation of the scientific consensus by US presidents became a tradition. President George H.W. Bush affirmed this consensus when he signed the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change at the Earth Summit in Rio de Janeiro in 1992. In his address to the conference, President Bush spoke of the need to take concrete action to protect the planet. However, even as the ink was drying on this landmark international environmental treaty, it was clear that the treaty was absent of binding targets and timetables for emissions reductions. There was a strong disconnect between the political rhetoric and the commitment to action. Why? Well, in the words of President Bush himself, the American way of life is not up for negotiations, period. This disconnect is perhaps best illustrated in the role played by the Bush Chief of Staff, John Sununu. Sununu has a PhD in mechanical engineering from MIT. And despite having no training in climate science, Sununu felt that he was qualified to pass judgment on the work of James Hansen, the director of NASA's Goddard Institute for Space Studies who had famously testified to the US Congress in the summer of 1988, just prior to Bush being elected president. Sununu described Hansen's work as technical poppycock. The science underlying the link between global warming and the combustion of fossil fuels, Sununu believed, was insufficient to warrant government action or societal expense. Hansen was due to testify once again in April 1989 at a new hearing called by Senator Al Gore. Hansen wanted to clarify that global warming would not just cause more heat waves, but also other extreme events such as floods. As was protocol for a government scientist, Hansen submitted his prepared remarks to the White House's Office of Management and Budget. This alerted Sununu, who then had the testimony heavily edited. Hansen described these edits as leaving his testimony meaningless. Although this effort at censorship was exposed and ultimately proved embarrassing for the Bush administration, Sununu's efforts to oppose climate change policy and any regulations limiting carbon dioxide emissions that he thought would stifle economic growth continued. To this end, Sununu was instrumental in sabotaging the first attempts by the international community to produce a global treaty to limit carbon emissions. In November 1989, 400 officials from 65 countries met in Nordvik in the Netherlands to discuss a framework for a global treaty on greenhouse gas emissions. Most of the delegations were prepared to endorse the Dutch proposal to freeze emissions at 1990 levels by 2000 and a reduction of 20% by 2005. Sununu had a climate change skeptic appointed to the US negotiating team. His appointee was given orders to prevent any US commitment to limits. No agreement was forged. In a 2018 interview for his article, Losing Earth, The Decade We Almost Stopped Climate Change, Nathaniel Rich asked Sununu whether he felt responsible for killing the attempt at a global climate accord. His answer was both cynical and accurate. It couldn't have happened, he told Rich, because frankly the leaders of the world at the time were at the stage where they were all looking at how to seem like they were supporting the policy without having to make hard commitments that would cost their nation serious resources. Sununu's next sentence is chilling. 
frankly, that's about where we are today. The rest of the Bush presidency, as indicated by the failure of the 1992 Earth Summit in Rio to commit to binding limits on carbon dioxide emissions, continued this doctrine and the rest of the world followed suit. To say that this story was a failure to listen to the science and the climate science experts and the hubris of the powerful to believe they are right because they have a PhD would be to simplify and ignore the other socio-economic and geopolitical considerations at play. But it is a story that needs to be heard and understood. It further illustrates the importance of questioning the authority of a source, to ask yourself, what are the qualifications of the source? Thanks for listening.